Well, I want to thank everybody for taking their time on a Saturday to learn more about migraine. Um, it's such an important topic for you all to understand what you or perhaps some of your family members or friends are going through with regards to migraine. And so what I'm going to tell you about today is how there's some exciting treatments that have been on the market now for probably about two years now. We've seen a great um, influx of um, development of new drugs, which is finally, finally, um, I, I've been a neurologist um, since 1998. And I remember the time that was the time when the trip dance first came out. And it was a miracle drug for people that can remember back at that time when the trip dance first came out. Um, but unfortunately, since then, there really had not been many drugs that had come to the market. Second. I guess I have to go to my right screen there. Okay, let's see. Sorry about that. Let's see if I can do it this way. Oh, there we go. Um, my disclosures um, are I'm a, I'm a speaker's bureau and advisory boards for these companies. Um, but what I will be speaking about today will be fair and balanced and give you my honest opinion about these different medications that are out there. Well, you all know that migraine is a disabling disorder. You live with it all the time. Um, it's an episodic disorder, but for people, it's a lifelong disorder. In fact, it's the second leading cause of the number of years lived with disability worldwide. And so it has a huge impact. If you look at the United States, there's about 36 million adults in the US affected by migraine. We know that women are three times more affected than men. Worldwide, there's about a, a billion people with migraine. And what we know though, over time, is that um, effective treatments can not only reduce the risk of migraine frequency, but it can actually reduce the risk of progression to more severe disease. So it's not really good just to tell people to go ahead and suffer with their headache because the more that they are inadequately treated, the worse their headaches get. And <laughs> so what, sorry about that. Um, so our, what we have found though is over time is that if we come up with um, migraine specific disease targeted therapies, we can probably give patients much better relief. And I'll talk to you just a little bit about um, migraine pathophysiology and we certainly have evolved this over time. We do know that migraine is both a peripheral nerve disorder as well as having a central nervous system component. There's the peripheral nerve, which is the trigeminal ganglion, which is uh, this uh, little nerve that comes out here. And this innervates the meningeal blood vessels. And this is the meninges, that's the coverings of the brain. Um, and then there's also some um, um, resident immune cells as well. Um, and then there's the central component, which the trigeminal ganglion then goes up into the brain stem, goes up into the thalamus, and then you can see how it's oops, how it is then distributed across the cortex of the brain. So I'm going to talk to you about new medications that have been developed based upon calcitonin gene-related peptides. Back in the early 80s, we began to realize that calcitonin, calcitonin gene-related peptide, which is a neuropeptide, was probably a very important um, vasodilator. And then in the mid 80s, we found that that probably meant that there was probably some component um, of migraine. And so a number of studies were done and they showed that people with migraine had elevated levels of CGRP during a migraine attack. And then what they found is that when you gave sumatriptan during a migraine, not only did it take away the migraine, but it also decreased the level of CGRP. And so that proved to us that probably CGRP is a big link in migraine. And they've even given infusions of CGRP and sure enough, this will induce a migraine. So there are really three main mechanisms. Um, calcitonin gene-related peptide is a potent vasodilator. Um, and so 
we know when there is a migraine is stimulated um, that there is a release of neuroinflammation and you can see up at the upper um, here, um, there's a release of these mast cells, which is these auto um, inflammatory cells. And then what you have here too is the CGRP also causes the vasodilatation of um, the blood vessels. And also it is important for um, pain transmission up into the trigeminal nerve, up into the brainstem. So if the, there are certain targets um, for migraine, we know CGRP um, and also serotonin. Um, we know the tryptans work on the 5-HT1B1D receptor. And we know that there's also a new receptor and a new drug out that works on the 5-HT1F receptor, the serotonin 1F receptor. And so this is another just cartoon diagram showing the different areas that these new migraine and older migraine medications work. So let's talk about acute treatments. Well, what do patients want? What is their wish list? Well, patients will say, I want my attacks to be treated rapidly and consistently, and I don't want the headache to return. And I wanna be able to function normally. And I wanna rely, don't have to rely on other rescue medications or going to the doctor or going to the emergency room to seek help for my migraines. And I want to be able to afford my migraine medicines and if there'd be minimal or no side effects would also be great. And I think this is a great wish list for people really to want when seeking acute treatment. So when we take a look at acute treatments, we take a look at what we call step care approach or stratified care approach. Now, many times patients have already started treating with over-the-counter analgesics. They'll try the ibuprofen, naproxen, um, excedrins. Um, and then um, they may go to their physicians and get some other anti-inflammatories. Um, and then later they may then go to more migraine specific medicines, the tryptans, dihydroergotamine, BHE, and now the new DTANs and GPANs. And then as a fourth wave, if those still don't work, they rely on rescue therapies and corticosteroid therapies. But you can see if you do this slowly over time, just adding up all these things, you're really delaying um, how fast you can treat your migraine. And so what we recommend is really treating your migraine based upon the profile of associated symptoms and the level of disability. So if your level of disability is high, then you should really go with more of the migraine specific therapies, which are the tryptans, the DAT, the DTANs, and the GPANs. So as a physician, what do I do when I'm choosing an abortive or acute therapy for my uh, migraine patients? Um, I want to consider what diseases you may have. Do you have a history of heart attacks? We know that tryptans are not indicated in people who have had heart attacks, strokes, or other vascular disease. I have to also be considerate of people that have kidney disease. We know that anti-inflammatories, taking those too often, can exacerbate that. And then I also, because you know, women um, of childbearing age um, are often the women that I'm treating in my headache clinic. And so I wanna be sure to ask about pregnancy. And that should be always something if you're thinking when you go to see your physician to bring up that, if, you know, if you're thinking in it within the next six months to a year, I like having those discussions early on so that we can make that collaborative decision about what we do and don't wanna prescribe for you. And then I wanna take a look and see what other medicines have you used? Um, have they been efficacious for you? Um, did they produce any sensitivities or adverse reactions that you did not like? Um, and then I wanna take a look at how your attacks are. Do they build up fast? Do you wake up with a severe headache and it's at its maximum intensity? Or do you have nausea and vomiting and thus a pill may not be the right medication for you? And then I also have to check with you, your level of comfort with injections or nasal sprays. Not everybody is, in, is comfortable with taking injections or nasal sprays. And so again, having that collaborative discussion with my patients is important. 
So these are the list of the various acute treatments that are available for migraine. Um, certainly the over-the-counter medications, um, analgesics, um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories such as diclofenic, um, naproxen, um, ibuprofen are great medications. Um, the triptans, we have uh, seven different triptans that are currently on the market. Um, you may um, recognize these names. I'm sure many of you have been on many of these. Sumatriptan is the gold standard, the one that's been out the longest, um, but there's Rizotriptan, Zomatriptan, Frovatriptan, um, Almatriptan, um, Naratriptan, uh, I'm going down the list here, but um, you can see that there's a large list that people can um, choose from. And then we have the DHE and ergotamines, um, which people don't really rely on too often, although there is a new one that's gonna be coming out um, DHE, a nasal spray. So be on the lookout for that in the next um, probably year or two. Um, neuromodulation, which you'll talk, I think Dr. Reed is going to talk to you about next. And then there's also opioids that people use for migraines, although um, there really is not great evidence that they are used or should be used to treat migraines um, because they can lead to medication overuse as well as abuse. Um, and then there's the new G pants and the D tans, which I'll talk to you about. The fact of the matter is most people with migraine have never used an acute prescription medication for their migraine attacks. Um, and then of those people that have tried triptans, um, about 55 will discontinue it because of either lack of efficacy or side effects. And we know that if people do not have a good abortive, then they do tend to turn toward the opioids that they have in their closet left over from some surgical procedure. And we know that this leads to the risk of medication overuse um, headache. So for migraine patients, it's often difficult um, when to take my medications. Patients um, avoid taking their medications. They wonder, is it a migraine? Am I gonna have enough pills left over? Remember that many of the insurance companies only allow us to give 10 to 12 um, tablets of a prescription of a triptan per month. And, and then other patients worry, if I take this medication and I'm at work, am I gonna to continue to be able to function? And so I think there's some simple things that when you go and speak with your physician after you've been taking your um, abortive medication, um, you can ask, does your migraine medicine work consistently in the majority of your attacks? Well, if it works, you know, 90% of the time, well, we're doing pretty well then. Um, and then you can be pretty happy with how your medication's doing. The other thing is to check for the relief of headache. Does the headache pain disappear within two hours? That should be our gold standard is that you should be able to start functioning within two hours of taking an abortive medication. Sometimes patients say, yeah, my medication works. Um, the headache's gone in about 24 hours. And I'm trying to think to myself, well, that doesn't seem very effective to me. Um, and I wonder if the headache was just going um, on its own. Um, and then not only is the headache gone, but are you able to function within those two hours? And then do you have any side effects from your medications that allow you to continue um, to plan your daily activities? Or are you in bed because of the side effects of the medicines? So I promised you I would talk to you about some of the new migraine medicines. And lismitidan, which is Rayvow, is one of the new 5-HT1F receptor agonists. It is very exciting to be able to offer this um, to patients with migraine, particularly those who have underlying cardiovascular disease or stroke, because what's important is this 5-HT1F receptor does not cause vasoconstriction such as the tryptans do. So the 5-HT1F receptor is located both in the peripheral and central nervous system. And it's important for modulating pain signaling um, and inhibits pain pathways in both the trigeminal nerve and it also prevents the least release of neurotransmitters, including CGRP. And again, it does not cause vasoconstriction of the blood vessels. So it's very um, exciting to be able to offer this to patients. 
Well, let's switch now to the other new ones that are out on the market, the G pants. Well, these are oral small molecule calcitonin gene related peptide receptor antagonists. And so what they do is they prevent the effect of CGRP. So um, um, you have two, two that are currently on the market. You have Ubrojapant, which is Ubrelvi, and we have Remagipant, which is Nurtec, ODT. Both of these currently are available for acute treatments. Now, what's interesting is Remagipant or Nurtec is probably gonna be approved for preventative therapy maybe as, as soon as 2021. I believe um, uh, they put in for an indication for this. So this will be the first time that a medication has been used for both acute therapy as well as preventative therapy. And what's interesting about these is that these medications probably do not lead to medication overuse headache. And I know that's always been a concern for patients when we talk about medication overuse headache it's really not the fault of the patient. They have frequent migraines and the use of um, analgesics on a frequent basis can lead to more and more headaches. What's nice about these G pants is that they are unlikely to cause medication overuse headache. There are still some in clinical trials as well. A Togepant, which is also gonna be looked at as a migraine preventative, but as a daily dose, um, now, the Nurtec one is going to be an every other day dosing. And then there's also Zavagipan, which is they're looking at now too, and that's going to be a nasal spray. And what's nice is that's going to be um, give, give patients relief as soon as 15 to 30 minutes. And so that might be a nice alternative treatment for patients as well. Okay. And so um, here you have the list. Um, of Ubrelvi and Neurotec, which are the two G pants. And you can see their uh, manufacturer and then the doses are listed here. Ubrelvi, you can take one tablet and repeat in two hours if needed. Neurotec is a little bit simpler. You just take one dose and that's it for the day. It's 75 milligrams, um, but only one dose in a 24 hour period. And then you have, oh, have um, Rava, which is lismidadan, which is that, either a 50, 100, or 200 milligram dose. And, and again, it's just one dose in a 24 hour period. The efficacies of these are very similar to the triptans that have currently previously been on the market, which is great. But you can see here that the pain relief in two hours, of, or um, I should say pain freedom, is close to 20% for both. Ubrelvi and Nurtec. Uh, um, and then the Rayvow, the two hour pain relief is a little bit higher at 29%. Um, so um, there is a little bit difference um, in these. Um, you do wanna be careful of side effects. Uh, the nausea um, and drowsiness are the most common in the G pants. With Lismidadan, it can cause some fatigue and dizziness as well. And um, there is a warning with the Rayva, which I'll talk to you about in a second. Um, there's the driving impairment that you can't take this drug and drive for eight hours. So as precautions, um, the G-Pants do have some drug-to-drug -drug interactions that you have to worry about um, due to the processing through the liver pathway. And none of them are recommended during pregnancy because they just have not been studied. As I said, the rave out does have the driving impairment and we do recommend that people not drive for eight hours at taking this. So for people that are going to work, we may say, well, gosh, wait to take the rave out while you get to work and then you're fine to drive home after work. Um, you know, and people won't necessarily know when they are impaired driving or not. So it's not something that you can tell. Rayvow is also a scheduled five um, substance due to the fact that some people reported euphoria with it, but it's a, again, a low risk addiction drug. So let's switch now to talk about prevention. Um, you should consider prevention when there's a significant interference with your daily activities with migraines. Typically we say at least one migraine per week, patients should be on a preventative therapy. Those patients that are at risk for 
medication overuse, that they're taking more and more medications um, should be on a preventative therapy. And in those patients where acute therapies are either ineffective or contraindicated, or um, maybe are having some trouble side effects. And then we do have um, some uncommon migraines um, that will put people on preventives just because they are so disabling, as well as patient preference. Some patients just want to have as few migraines as possible. So these are the different preventative therapies that are currently out. The antidepressants, typically we talk about the tricyclic antidepressants, the amitriptyline, nortriptyline, doxepin, um, and sometimes we use some of the newer SNRIs, um, um, venlafaxine, um, uh, desvenlafaxine, um, Cymbalta, or some drugs that you may be familiar with having treated your migraines. We do use antihypertensives, the beta blockers, the calcium channel blockers, uh, ARBs. There's a whole list of medications that can be used. And then we have the antiepileptics. One of my favorites is topiramate. Um, um, we also use Velproate. And then neurotoxins, which is um, approved for chronic migraine, onobotulinum toxin. I do find good use in the nutraceuticals, magnesium and B2 in particular. Um, neuromodulation, again, both abortive and preventative. And then we can never forget about the non-pharmacologic, the behavior modification that's so important for managing our migraines. And then the new anti-CGRP monoclonal antibodies. So let's take a look at the preventative monoclonal antibodies. Um, <coughs> um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, migraine preventative therapies for the CGRP monoclonal antibodies are exciting because they have a lot extended biological half-life. And because of this, you can either give them um, monthly or quarterly. They do have to be given either sub-Q or intravenous because they are large molecules. Um, but the nice thing is they don't require any dose titration. And the rapid, the onset of action is very rapid compared to other conventional oral preventative drugs where you have to titrate and wait for four to six weeks to see a benefit. You may see a benefit as soon as a week, which is great. Patients don't want to have to wait. Um, and the studies have all proven to be positive with very favorable adverse effect profile. And, um, you know, in the past, many of the medicines that I talked to you just briefly before were all borrowed from other therapeutic areas. And really, at best, only 45% of patients would have about a 50% responder rate, which is what we really want when we're taking a look at a preventative therapy. And it was never shown that these medications would be helpful in prevention if patients were using overusing medications. And they weren't shown to necessarily decrease the amount of medication use. And so prevented with the monoclonal antibodies, um, you can use it for episodic, you can use it for chronic migraine, you can use it for medication overuse, um, episodic cluster. And as I said, you might get therapeutic benefit less than a week to a month um, after starting these medications. And they have been shown to lower acute medication use and they help, in, especially if those people are struggling with medication overuse headache. And what's exciting is that at least 50% of patients do get a 50% responder rate and that there's even some patients that have a 75 to 100% responder rate. We call them these super responders. And these are the different meds. Um, now, arenumab, fermanizumab, galcanizumab, which is also approved for cluster headaches, and eptimizumab. So arenumab, which is amovig, is approved at 70 or 140 milligrams, and that's given monthly. We have fermanizumab, which is a Jovi, and that's given sub-Q or sub-Q auto-injector, and you can give this 225 milligrams monthly, or you have the option to give it quarterly, where you would give the three injections um, every quarter instead of every month. The galcanizumab, which is Mgality, is an auto-injector as well, and that's given as an initial loading dose of 240 milligrams, followed by 120 milligrams monthly. For cluster headaches, it's approved for episodic, and the dosing is different. It does come in um, 300 milligrams 
three 100 milligram pre-filled syringes. And then the newest one that's out on the market, um, which we just started using in our headache infusion room um, with some good success um, is Pepimizumab, the Yepti. And this is either given as 100 milligrams or 300 milligrams quarter. And so these are the different um, um, injections that you can see that you can come, they're all very easy to give, auto injectors. Um, and each of the pharmaceutical companies have nice um, online videos that you guys can watch to make sure that you're giving yourself the correct dosings. And I know I do demonstrate in the office as well. All these monoclonal antibodies in episodic migraine have been shown to reduce the headache frequency by one to two headache days per month and in chronic migraine, four to six headache days per month. And um, that's a significant, if you look over 12 months, um, you know, four, four headaches over 12 months, that's 48 days without a headache, that's significant. The most common adverse effect is really just injection site pain and erythema. Um, my patients usually don't tell me how much it, help, it hurts unless I ask them. And then they say, yes, it does hurt quite a bit but um, it's certainly well, well worth it. Um, again, patients really have found these just so much of a game changer for them to decrease the frequency of headaches that they never thought was possible before. Oops, let me go back. Um, there is some, uh, one thing um, for Renumab, which is Amovig, there has been post-marketing constipation and hypertension noted. And so if patients do have um, those, I may consider using um, one of the other um, monoclonal antibodies. And I do tell patients um, um, that we should not use these if they're planning pregnancy because these do last in your system a long time, five months. So we, you'd have to plan at least five months after your last injection before you would plan pregnancy. All right. And now we're getting close to the end here. But um, so who, who gets these migraine, um, these monoclonal antibodies? Well, certainly those people um, that have lower frequency episodic migraine four to seven days per month, you know, if they have moderate or disability and impacted by their migraines and have tried two other preventative therapies, most insurance companies are readily approving these medications, which is really great. Certainly those people that have high frequency episodic migraine and those with chronic migraine, um, but again, either having tried um, and failed two other preventative therapies, including Botox if it's chronic migraine. So where does it fit into our clinic? Um, well, I think patients that have previously failed, you know, other preventative therapies, it's a great option to use. And the fact that they have failed other preventative therapies doesn't mean that they will not respond to the monoclonal antibodies, that they are likely to respond. Um, we really don't know which of the monoclonal antibodies is better. Um, I use, I choose it based upon what your insurance company prefers. Um, I find all of them quite beneficial. Sometimes if patients haven't found benefit, I like to give it a three to six month trial before I give up on the medication. And then we may consider switching to another one to see if there is any benefit if the patient has not responded. Sometimes patients do notice a little wearing off before the next dose. In the case of um, a Jovi, you may consider going to the quarterly dose so that you do not notice that wearing off before the next dose. And we don't think there's gonna be any long-term effect. We know there's some five-year data out about the safety of CGRP. And so far the data looks very good. Um, we are using it in all types of migraine, migraine with and without aura. Um, and even in people that have hemiplegic migraine. Um, and then the other question is, well, like, gosh, I was using onobotulinum toxin. I find that it's very effective. Can I use um, CGRP? And the question, the answer is yes, you can. All right, so that's um, it. I hope you guys all have a happy Thanksgiving. I know it's all gonna be on a much smaller scale this year, unfortunately. Um, but I think it's all important for us to keep our families safe. So I'm um, happy to answer some questions now. Katie, I think you had some questions maybe beforehand or? Yeah, thank you very much. 
let me get to our question screen. And uh, great presentation, a lot of information in there. Tried many of those med medications. Um, okay, um, can you take trip scans with Raynaud's, Raynaud's disease? Raynaud? So no, so with Raynaud's disease, the tryptans are considered contraindicated. That would be considered one of the um, vascular, especially if you have significant Raynaud's. Some people have very mild Raynaud's, but if you have significant Raynaud's, I would recommend using either Rayvow, which is the new 5-HT1F receptor. That would be much safer for you or using one of the G-PANs. I would recommend that. But it's nice that we finally have options for people with Raynaud's. Great, thank you. Um, do migraines and overuse of medications put you at more risk for strokes? Um, so no, so um, migraine with aura does have a slightly increased risk of stroke compared um, to those patients with uh, out migraine or with just migraine, um, but it's a very slow, a light, slight risk. Um, so, but it doesn't have to do with the frequency of migraines. Okay. It really just has to do with the aura. Okay, great. Um, why is there a limit on migraine prescriptions that, you know, when you only get 10 or seven of one? I know it's very frustrating. And, um, and I, I used to also think, that, you know, that, oh, why is there, but, you know, so then I would be nice at first when I think they first came on and people said, well, my insurance company allows me 18. Um, and I promise I won't take it all. And then all of a sudden, a year down the road, they're taking 18 um, a month. And, um, you know, so really, it, it's really a safety mechanism and really, you know, allow, encourages you to use other mechanisms to abort your headache or not just treat it so quickly okay. as well. So that's, that's the main reason is, um, the main reason the insurance will say is because it wasn't studied in the um, clinical trials. Um, okay. Is there a reason behind it? But, um, but I think there is some safety with not using it too frequently. Okay, thank you. Um, do you have any ideas on overuse of medications? Yes, so overuse of medications, really the limit is 10 days per month. So, and it's not 10 days of using my sumatriptan and 10 days of using my naproxen um, you know, so then all of a sudden you're at 20 days. It's really 10 days a month. So trying to keep it to two headache days a week that you're treating a migraine will help you um, avoid medication overuse headache or rebound headache. Okay, great. Uh, we have a few more. Um, can older people take CGRPs? I know they are new on the market. Yeah, well, and that's the nice thing is that they did take a look at um, patients, um, gosh, I want to say they took maybe up at age 75, that they did evaluate in the clinical trials, um, and they did take a look at people that had some underlying cardiovascular risk as well, too. So yes, it is nice that it's an option for people. Now, if I had someone that had very significant, um, you know, ongoing cardiac disease, I might, um, you know, avoid, you know, using them at right now, but, um, but in general, um, we're using them safely in people of all ages. That's excellent. Great. That's good news. Yes. Can you take, can you take a triptan with an SSRI? Sarah, um, and then it says serotonin syndrome. Yes, I know. So we always get that call from the pharmacy um, that, yeah. you know, there's a risk of serotonin syndrome and it's actually probably not true. The receptors are different. In fact, there's American Headache Society has a, a statement out that the risk of serotonin syndrome um, is very rare and it really should not, you know, be considered the, with the triptan, so. Okay, so I mean, fine. I guess it's good that they're checking, right? Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, I get flagged on some things too. I mean, I guess that's good. Yeah, I said, um, if, you get, if you get stiff, rigid fevers, <laughs> don't take right. them. <laughs> Right. I, I've never seen it myself, so. Okay, great. And um, if a patient does not have success with Ubrelvi, is it unlikely that they will have success with Nurtec? Um, no, so I do find that one, you know, patients have um, responded one or the other, you know, they do, do work differently. So I think it's definitely worth a trial if one didn't seem to be beneficial to you. Okay, excellent. 
do, do triptans have a higher level of effectiveness at two hours than 20%? Um, that was, let's see, pain free. They were, I want to say they're slightly, they might have a slight, it, it's, it's about the same. It may be maybe 25 or 30% for some of them. Okay. Might be slightly higher. Okay. Okay. Last question. Um, what differences have you seen in dosing a Jovi monthly versus quarterly? And does either have better efficiency, more severe wearing off? Yeah, so I think the wearing off would be one of the benefits of using the quarterly over the monthly so that you don't have that wearing off. And it seems very strange, but you have to take a look at the, the profile that they have um, on the pharmacokinetics of it. But it's very strange that you get this peak and then it kind of comes down to the same level at three months as, a, as if you had a month month. So, um, so that would be a benefit of using it. So I have not had any problems. The only problems I have is sometimes patients don't want to give three shots at once, but right. I think I, most of my patients prefer to start monthly first and then see how it goes. And then they would switch over. Okay, great. Well, thank you. And I just wanted to commend you when you were talking, you, you were just talking about something and you said, um, when you collaborate with your patient. I you. love that because it's so important that um, patients and doctors are a team. And so I commend you for that because there's so many times that that's not the case. So thank well, you. Thank for you. That. Thank you. <laughs> um, so that's a one time, I, I'll tell you a story. I had a patient once and I, she had tried just about everything there is. And, and I, I, was, I was a brand new physician at that time. and. Uh, and I couldn't think of anything that she hadn't tried. And so my, one of my doctors that it was, um, you know, I had taught maybe headache medicine. Uh, he says, well, I don't know. She hasn't tried naproxen. I thought, so I went back and then she came back and she was so happy. And I realized afterwards it probably was not necessarily the naproxen, but it was the fact that I had taken the time to, got to, to get to know her. And maybe mm -hmm. it was a benefit for her. Well, it's so important to us. I as I said, I don't know if you were on the beginning, but I lead some support groups and I have so many people in there that have said to me, doctors have told me they're done with me. They can't hear anything else. And it breaks my heart because I have such a wonderful physician. And I was actually with him yesterday and someone had told me that on my way to see him. And I said to him, would you ever tell me you're done and you can't do anything else? And he said, never. So you know, it's thank you for, for saying that. And thank, so, and thank goodness we have all these new medicines coming out that we, we don't have a reason to say that anymore. <laughs> That's very true. So thank you very much for your thank presentation you. and thank your time. You. All right. Thank you so much.